Thanks. Uh, it's really it's really nice to be here. I was thinking about the Scheme Workshop last night, and uh, actually the first academic workshop event thing that I ever went to was the Scheme Workshop, the 2003 Scheme Workshop uh, in Boston, uh, so 15 years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. So I'm going to talk about this project I've been working on over the past um, few years on uh, trying to build a gradual path from scripting languages to um, theorem proving languages, okay? Uh, and, um, and I'm gonna show you how we've been doing this in, um, in a scheme-like scheme language, okay? So uh, this is what it's always felt like to me to program uh, in scheme, okay? So this is Calvin and Hobbes doing a safety check before they uh, on their sled before they go down, so they've got seat belts, nope, uh, signals, no, nope. brakes, no, nope. steering, no, nope. and then they go for it, right? <laughs> uh, you know, do we have a type system? Nope. Is it pure? Nope. Do function calls and returns, you know, match and bracket well? Nope. Uh, you know, sort of uh, all bets are off. Okay, so uh, it's a weird language to program in. It's a weirder language to try to do program verification in, right? Because the language is not giving you a whole lot to start with. Um, but I've been inspired by uh, gradual typing, okay? So gradual typing is sort of addressing the same, the same problem, but trying to get us from, um, you know, to build a path between uh, typed and untyped. Uh, programs, and, um, and I'm really inspired by that. I'm just trying to, say, take it maybe a bit further than just static typing. Okay. Uh, so here's, here's, a, here's a gradually typed program uh, in TypeTracket, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about how this works uh, in TypeTracket. So here I've got a module that's typed called argmin that's providing this uh, this argmin function, and then I've got a client that's untyped, okay? Uh, and this, this specification here is that uh, for all types of elements, this takes uh, a function, a real valued function, a non-empty uh, list of elements, and gives you back the element that minimizes that function that you gave it, okay? And my client here, the first one is, uh, is okay, but the second one uh, is not, and when you run this, okay, so this error doesn't get caught statically, uh, but it gets caught at runtime, but it's telling you about some contract violation, okay? So saying that, uh, that this function over here didn't live up to uh, a piece of the spec here, which is that it promised to produce uh, real numbers. Okay, so you would sort of expect it to crash over here uh, but what happens is the, the contract system that is being used to enforce the type abstraction here is going to catch it before that, that happens and, and blame this module over here for breaking what you wrote down as the type. And the mechanism for this is what happens is type bracket just erases the types and inserts a contract, which is a runtime mechanism that's going to enforce uh, the, the type that you wrote down. And I think the important thing is just to note that this is just code in the language, okay? So things like real huh um, or uh, uh, real a for the Canadians in the room um, <laughs> is, uh, is just a predicate in the language. We can write whatever we want here, okay? And in fact, we could do, we could write uh, stronger specifications as contracts. So here's, here's a dependent contract that's saying, you know, that in fact the result uh, produces a minimal uh, element uh, uh, for F on, on the list and things like that. And really this is kind of, this is where I'm gonna try to tackle this problem is can we verify uh, specifications like this, contracts. Okay. All right, so the vision for this work is um, you know, if we sort of take a look at, as a community, where we're, uh, where we're headed, right, it's very much not the Calvin and Hobbes uh, view of, of programming. 
uh, we would like to have these very rigorous behavioral guarantees that scale up to total correctness uh, with user-specified properties and machi machine-checked proofs and have it be highly automated. And there's, there's several languages that, um, that, that do this, okay? Which is? Uh, Agda. Agda doesn't have a good logo. Uh, if Agda had a good logo, it would be on here. Um, uh, the, this is not the official cock logo, but I liked it. Uh, yeah. Um, but the, the problem I see is how do we get from, uh, you know, the tens of millions of lines of code in languages that we have now to, to things like that? And I think the thing that we need is to build a bridge uh, from scripting languages to these verification integrated languages. Okay. So the, the, that, that, and that's the question I've been looking at. And the, I have some design goals here that, you know, a solution to this problem ought to be gradual in the sense that we can sort of live anywhere along this spectrum of verified to unverified, but with strong guarantees. Uh, it ought to be reinforcing, meaning there ought to be some incentive to verifying more of your program. Uh, and we ought to be able to build uh, tools that, that help you get there. And hopefully, you know, the techniques should be, if not universal, at least widely applicable. Okay, so the, the thesis behind this work is I've got, I've got this kind of recipe for doing gradual verification. And it's got three components to it, uh, runtime enforcement mechanisms, symbolic execution, and abstract interpretation. And I'm going to talk about these three components. So uh, we can start to take a closer look now. All right, so here, let me set up sort of what I mean by program verification and um, tie it into things that uh, you're certainly familiar with, OK? So in general, right, it means we we want to run our program, so over here I've got a program. We want to run our program and make sure it doesn't crash, okay? And crash I'm using just to stand in for some kind of, uh, you know, safety property. Uh, um, so, uh, well, maybe not in this room, but uh, most of us are uh, familiar with the, the theorem well type programs don't go wrong. I'm, just, I'm kidding, I know. I know people in this room know this stuff. but. Um, uh, but this is a kind of uh, verification. It's, you know, arguably one of the most widely used forms of formal methods is a type system. And it gives you this kind of guarantee that uh, if your program is well typed, well, it doesn't prove that it won't crash when you run it, but there's a certain class of errors uh, called wrong states that you can guarantee that your program won't get into, okay? And it's stronger than just saying your program doesn't reach that state because it deals with components, right? It's modular, compositional. Uh, because you can have an incomplete program, right, that's going to be linked against other components and you have some type specification for those and you know that, uh, that if this program is well typed, then no matter what you link it against, as long as it has the type that you specified there, it's also not going to go wrong. Uh, we can contrast this with uh, gradual typing. Okay, so gradual typing sort of would like to have that, uh, that same property, but here you're going to be linking against potentially untyped code. Okay, well, your theorem isn't, isn't going to be true anymore, but you can have some refinement of it. Okay, so you can partition the wrong states that you, get, uh, that you can get into in a way that attributes some to the uh, typed program and attribute some to the untyped program. And you can say that well-typed programs can't be blamed, okay? So that uh, you can't get into a wrong state that is attributed to the type program. Okay. So the way that I'm looking at program verification is, is sort of in that, uh, in that light. We've got programs. They're linked against other programs. We have some kind of specification that sits at the boundaries of these things. And we have some mechanism for attributing uh, crashes to, to the different parts of the program. And what I would like to do is have this kind of modular verification 
where I can say, I've got a component, I know what the specs are on it, and I can, uh, you know, no matter what I link into it, I may have errors that get attributed to those components because I don't know what they are ahead of time, but I ought to be able to, to say that if I verify the program I'm looking at that, um, that it can't, can't be blamed, okay? Okay, so let me, uh, let me show you an example of what I mean by runtime enforcement. This is just gonna be um, contracts for me, but I think that it generalizes to other kinds of runtime enforcement mechanisms. Um, okay, so uh, let's take a look at a program. So here's the, the scheme and functional programming. Here's, here's the functional programming side, right? It's written in, uh, written in ML notation or OCaml notation. So just imagine more parentheses here. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so here's a program and I've partitioned it into two modules here and I have some, um, I have some specification for it. And uh, this program, when you run it, it's gonna do one over zero and crash. And I would, I would claim that really this is the fault of, uh, of, of this. And if we view this type as a contract, then that's what happens, okay? So here's a little um, contract uh, monitoring tutorial, okay? So as we run this program, what happens? Well, we're gonna call F, that's the module we've linked against, passing in this uh, function, which gets dropped on the floor and it divides by zero. So we're transferring control into the, into the yellow program, binding G to this thing uh, with this contract, and then we do one over zero. The crash happened in the yellow code. There were no specification violations, so it's the yellow program's fault, okay? All right, let's take a step back and change the program to actually use the function and do something here. Same spec, same blue program. Okay, so we transfer control in, G gets bound to this. Now we're gonna apply G to zero. So uh, we're gonna transfer control back into the blue program. Now you get to this point where uh, you've got a, a base type value uh, with a, a contract saying it's an integer. So you just check it, right? You look at zero and you say, that's definitely an integer. So you can dissolve this boundary, right? Yellow lived up to its, um, the terms of the contract delivered an integer value. So now you can, can just consider this as the blue program, which of course crashes and it's the blue program's uh, uh, fault here. Okay, so let's go back. Now let's touch up our specification here. Uh, we could do it with a uh, refinement type or equivalently here as a, um, as a contract that's got this attached predicate to it saying that uh, it can't be zero, okay? Um, all right, so now what happens? We jump into the yellow program. It applies G with zero. We jump back to here. Remember we're at the, we're, so we're at the point where we've got the base, uh, base value and um, this spec here, and we just look at it and say, okay, is zero an integer? Sure but is it not equal to zero? It's not, so yellow, the yellow program has not lived up to the, to the contract here, and uh, we attribute the, the blame to it, okay? So, <clears throat> if you think about it for a second, uh, um, it ought to be the case that this blue program with that specification, uh, has no, there's no way that you can cause it to crash in such a way that it blames the, the blue program here, okay? So <clears throat> that's kind of the, the intuition of what we wanna achieve. We just now need a mechanism for doing it, okay? And that brings me to the topic of symbolic execution. So here's the idea. We've got our program and we are going to link it against uh, a symbolic piece of uh, code. And the idea here is that this symbolic code that you link it against is, its only, go uh, its only goal in life is to try to break uh, 
the blue program. And conceptually, you can think of it as it's code that you don't know yet what it does, but you, you will refine uh, its possible behavior as you run the program, okay? So back to our example. Uh, we've got our blue program. We've got our unknown black module over here. We jump into it, okay? Now remember, this code's only goal in life is to break the blue program. So uh, if somebody hands you a function, what can you do in order to break the function? Well, you can apply it, right? That's really uh, the only operation. Uh, so this isn't entirely true in, in Scheme and most realistic languages, but let's assume for the moment we can touch this up. But uh, the only thing you can do with the function is apply it. So the code, sort of without loss of generality, if it's able to break the blue code, it looks like this, right? Take the function in, apply it to something. What? I, it, we'll figure that out later, okay? So we sort of uh, transfer control right back to the blue program. Now we've gotten down to a first order unknown value here, and we're just trying to break this five over x. Okay, so if you view this as like a constraint problem, uh, it's, you know, solve for solve for x where 5 over x is going to produce a crash, and it, it's easy, right? It's, it should be 0. So, uh, so we can discover that this should be 0. Okay, so if you're sort of anticipating the technical details going on here, we're, we're accumulating these unknown values, some conditions on them. We're going to use an SMT solver to figure out what they need to be in order to make things crash. But we can also work our way backwards to construct uh, the counterexample that breaks our original program. The secret to your technique is that you look inside the black box. Uh, the secret is the black box has sort of a certain shape to it without loss of generality. And the only thing that you need to, so, and just by running it, you can figure out what the shape is, and then you just use an SMT solver for the base types to figure out what particular numbers you need. And you can read off from that the higher order values uh, that you started with, okay. So if we take a step back, right, we knew that that unknown needs to be zero, so now we know what this black uh, module needs to be, which tells you, you know, the, the function that you need to link against in order to break, uh, break the blue program. So we can sort of synthesize these higher order um, uh, inputs to the blue program that will that will break it here. Okay. So this is a nice sort of a property of this is that you get you get concrete counterexamples from it. Okay. And if we had refined the specification here, uh, what would happen? Well, we jump into the unknown thing, jump back to the blue. Now you get to this point where you have some unknown. Uh, uh, integer and it needs to be, you know, it, it both cannot be equal to zero, but also make five over X unsafe. And there is no such X. Okay. So this is going to be, um, this is going to be a safe, safe thing to do. So the symbolic execution keeps going. Uh, if you square an integer, that's also safe. Uh, so you will conclude by symbolically running this, that this program this program is safe, okay? Uh, here's a slight variation on that example. I went back to the relaxed spec, but I sort of programmed defensively, um, okay? And so it's checking if x is zero, then it produces one, okay? And what happens here? Well, uh, we jump into the unknown thing, we jump back to the blue thing, now we have this, you know, we have to come up with an integer here for x. And what happens is uh, we can think about when we get to that is x equal to zero, there's two possibilities, right? Either that's going to produce true, in which case we know that x must be equal to zero. So the whole thing produces one. That's safe. If we step back uh, and say, well, it might be false, well, then we know x is not equal to zero. Uh, 
uh, in which case 5 over x is going to be safe. Okay? So having that kind of path condition that you accumulate here, if you program in this defensive style with an, with an if rather than a contract, it'll work just as well for that and, and prove that this program's safe too. Okay, so, uh, so that's the idea. You, you take a program, you run it symbolically. The symbolic semantics uh, is largely just sort of 1970s style uh, symbolic execution. Okay, so we have, um, we have a path condition. Uh, when you get to an unknown value, we give it, we identify it with some name. If you do some uh, partial operation, like division, uh, well, then you've got non-deterministically two cases, right? One is it produces something, you, you know something about what it produces, namely that it's uh, v over alpha, alpha can't be zero, and everything else in your path condition still holds. Or you get a crash, in which case alpha must have been zero. So similar with, uh, with equality, uh, conditionals, all that stuff is fairly straightforward. The, the sort of tricky bit here is what to do about functions. Okay? So here's, here's the, the basic idea. So if you are applying an unknown function to some value, the only interesting case here is when that value is a function. Right? So what can happen? Well, either sort of nothing bad happens, you get back, you get back some unknown thing, or you interact with the function. How can you interact with the function? Well, you can apply it to something. So you, apply, you generate a new unknown, you apply it to that. That, because we're in a higher order world, right, that may produce uh, another function, so you need to interact with that. Okay? So th that's sort of the small step reduction semantics for our um, symbolic semantics for dealing with functions. And that will work for all of the all of those examples that I that I just showed you, okay? All right. Um, so let's think about some other other things that can happen. So here's a function uh, that has um, has some mutable state in it, okay? And we've got this we've got this specification here saying, and it's dependent. It's saying uh, you give me. Uh, um, Sorry, what is this saying? Uh, uh, give me an x, then you have to give me a y that's bigger than x, uh, and it, it can be run for effect here. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, so you set up some reference here to zero, and you're going to pass off this uh, function, which closes over x to this unknown uh, context here. Right, and um, and this ought to. So what this does is it's going to update. So it takes in some number, and it sets that reference x to be the maximum of whatever x is uh, now, and the argument, and then produces whatever's in x. Okay. And the thing that's important here is that this unknown code doesn't have just a a raw access to that reference. It can't just set the reference directly. It has to sort of, there's, there's kind of a capability going on here, right? It has to interact with the cell through the closure here. And the closure is going to maintain that invariant that we had up there, okay? So we're able to verify um, stuff like this. Okay, here's a more, so here's something that should not go through. Right, so here uh, I, I set up a reference and I pass off a closure that increments the reference and then does one over dereference of x. Okay, so in what I've shown you so far, if you're only talking about, if you're talking about um, purely functional programs, if the, if the unknown module can break your code, it only needs to call the function once, right? Once is enough. But once you get into having uh, references in mutable state, uh, 
uh, that's not true anymore, right? So you pass this function off, and that code, if it invokes it enough times to, um, to increment this up to zero, then it will crash, and it'll be a crash in the, in the blue code here. So we're gonna have to do something more in order to, um, to show that this program can break. Okay. Uh, here's just a sort of twist on that program uh, um, to reveal another, another kind of subtle problem here, which is first you pat, yeah, yeah, Phil. You said you need to do more to break the code. So are you saying you know how to do that more, or are you saying yeah. in, you did? Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll show you. So the, the symbolic semantics I showed you so far would be unsound in the presence of references, and I'll show you how to fix it up. Yeah. Um, so here's, uh, here's just a variant where we pass off a closure that is doing the division. So when you get to this point, right, everything is fine. This code, it could call that function as many times as it wants, and it can't, it can't cause an error. And then if you sort of looked at this code, which does the increment, uh, you, if you looked at it in isolation, you would think that's fine as well. But what can happen is uh, because you're dealing with um, uh, an imperative language here, this first call, imagine that that code squirrels away that function. Then when it gets this one, it bangs away on the reference and then invokes the function that it had squirreled away, causing a division by zero, okay? Uh, so, so we're gonna have to sort of consider both uh, applying these functions uh, any number of times and also re-invoking functions that have, um, have already sort of escaped here, okay? So here's the update to the, uh, to the symbolic semantics. We additionally keep a set of uh, values that have previously escaped, okay? So when you apply an unknown function to a value, you're gonna add that value to the set, and then you're non-deterministically going to pick uh, a value out of the set of all the things that have escaped up to this point and interact with it, okay? And then, and now the examples that we've seen will work. Yeah, Jeremy. The code kind of escaping, is it, is it tied like on a per function basis? Or like, let's say you had another function B that you were calling, like would that be then be a different world or, or does it get kind of merged? So it's, it's really just this, that it, it's any argument uh, that ends up being, uh, sorry, any value that ends up being the argument of an unknown thing as you dynamically run it. Uh, is escaping. So that thing may have references to other, other values in it, which will sort of uh, potentially be uh, unleashed by this uh, interacting with it with the unknown stuff. Okay, okay so there's our, there's our symbolic execution <coughs> semantics. And uh, I guess the thing that you should be wondering is, uh, we have, you, we have this semantics, it's highly non-deterministic. Uh, um, it should be clear that you can't just, if you want an answer, you can't just run the symbolic semantics uh, and hope of, of finding, uh, finding out, of answering yes or no whether the program is verified or not. So you need something else to uh, cause this stuff to, to terminate. Okay, and give you what you're, what you want here is sort of a sound over approximation of the symbolic semantics that I just showed. Okay, well, uh, I have, I have a tool uh, called AAM, Abstracting Abstract Machines, and it's this um, systematic process where you take an evaluator written as a uh, abstract machine or um, a compositional evaluator, and you crank it through this process and what you get out is something that is guaranteed to be a sound um, terminating over, approximate, over approximating analysis of, 
uh, of the evaluator, okay? So it's an abstract interpreter for your, for your programs. So you start with some infinite deterministic transition system. It actually doesn't need to be deterministic, but if we're thinking about the usual semantics, it often is. And what you get out is some finite non-deterministic transition system. Okay, so usually we think of this being applied to things like the CESK machine or JVM semantics and things like that. But if you feed in the symbolic semantics, the technique works just as well. And what you get out is a sound contract verification engine. Okay, when you run your program on the, this uh, abstracted abstract machines, you get this finite state space uh, for the, that describes soundly the behavior of your program. And what you can do is look at it and see, like, if I get to some contract violation in this graph, well, that may happen at runtime, but if it's not in the graph, then you know that it can't possibly happen uh, at runtime. So if you have no blame uh, in the abstract, there's no way that you can have blame uh, at runtime. And a kind of corollary of that is uh, for particular contracts, if they can't be the sort of, if they can't be uh, violated and cause blame, then you don't need to monitor them at runtime, right? You can, you can verify uh, that the contract is always satisfied and then that can form the basis of uh, a contract optimization where you, you eliminate things and it can be done in a gradual way, right? You don't have to verify the whole program. You can look at individual contracts uh, and say, well, this contract can't be violated and this contract can't be violated. This one may be violated, so I need to keep the runtime monitoring uh, for that. Okay, so these, these are sort of three concrete uh, examples of these elements of, for the runtime enforcement mechanism using contracts, for symbolic execution using this notion of a higher order symbolic value, and for abstract interpretation using this AAM technique. Okay, so I would argue that it's gradual in the sense that you can, you can have residual contracts for the things that you don't verify. Um, you, you can go anywhere from, you know, scheme programs up to uh, 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 sort of simple types, up to refinement types, up to arbitrary properties expressed as uh, contracts. Uh, the contracts can be first class, uh, dependent, so on, right? Um, uh, it, works, it works fine for that stuff. It's reinforcing in the sense that the more contracts you write down, the more verification uh, is enabled. The more verification uh, that happens, uh, the less blame that can happen at runtime uh, and potentially better code that you generate, things like that. And my main argument for it being productive is that it gives you counterexamples and it works for higher order stateful programs, okay? So I would think it, it's gonna work for functional languages, uh, object-oriented languages, uh, and things like that. So the main results that we have uh, on the theory side is uh, we've got a mechanized proof of soundness. Um, we've got this uh, sort of generalized blame theorem that says verified programs can't be blame, blamed. And we have a uh, relative completeness proof for counterexamples, which uh, I think the takeaway message here, so the relative completeness is saying if you had uh, an SMT solver that was complete for the base values in your language, uh, integers, booleans, strings, and so on, then you could always generate a, even a potentially higher order counterexample uh, for your program. Of course, you can't have such a complete SMT solver, but you're sort of not losing, right? The counterexample generation um, is limited only by your SMT solver. The, the higher order functions aren't making this problem any harder. Okay, and then we've evaluated it, uh, so we have an implementation and evaluated it uh, uh, in comparison with what I would say are both light and heavyweight uh, alternatives, and it works with um, expressive contracts. 
So here's, uh, maybe let me just go through this real quick. Here's um, the empirical evaluation. So we looked at uh, soft typing. So we looked at sort of type systems for untyped languages, uh, occurrence typing, and then on the more heavyweight side, uh, higher order recursion schemes and model checking for functional programs. Uh, we've got some video games, and then we've got a bunch of imperative data structures and things like that. Uh, the, the checks are, because we're uh, in a language like Scheme, the language itself is inserting a bunch of runtime checks. So uh, the two numbers here are sort of the total number of checks that are inserted in your program, and then the, in parentheses are the user-specified properties. Um, and we're able to verify most things. Okay, so out of all of these uh, 50,000 or so checks, about 28 of them can't be verified here. Uh, and it, um, yeah, so I'm not sure I want to go into much more detail than that. Uh, we found some bugs in Slawtech, uh, but otherwise, Otherwise, uh, we didn't find any bugs. Um, yeah. Okay. So we can verify properties like. You said that there were some numbers in parentheses weren't all the problem. Uh, so they're the same. So here it's uh, how many in the total number of checks, how many were we able to not verify? And then of those, uh, what are the user specified properties? So if we look at like this hash table thing, there is one check, it was a user specified one, and we weren't, weren't able to to verify it. Yeah. Uh, how can I have a higher true, like here? Uh, so because the, so we were, we inspected the, um, uh, the results and confirmed. So I guess the total number of things here is, uh, Uh, I guess we just removed them from this column because we confirmed that they were real bugs. But there were two things that we looked at and they weren't, they weren't real bugs. Yeah, Fritz. Can you just say again, what exactly checks are? You know, like, four, on average, you know, like, the relation, the ratio of the line is about 4 to 1. Yeah. Dynamic checks? Or so that's all, that accounts for a lot of it, right? Because, uh, Right, so you're talking about you know some relatively small program, but you're running it in a scheme interpreter. So every time you apply a function, is it a function? Does it does its arity match the number of arguments I was given, and so on? Right. So all of those things we all, we verify, right? Because we verify that there's no runtime crash that happens. These are the static checks, then, right? I mean, this, yeah. this is the number of positions. They're static. Of, that's right. Where you know you do the checking or the that's right. That's right. Plus the user defined context verification. That's right. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, we're able to verify things like the soft typing work was able to verify occurrence typing, which does this um, sort of sophisticated control flow uh, based typing. Even these higher order model checking uh, papers by Kobayashi and his collaborators. Um, I don't want to say too much about these, I think. So uh, they have things like uh, verifying zip and unzip or identities and uh, you'll notice, so this is, this is reasoning about functions on lists, but you'll notice there's no lists here because they can't handle data structures and they have to abstract them to natural numbers first. Uh, but we're able to just verify the original list manipulating programs. Uh, Okay, I have more interesting stuff that I want to get to, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna skip through this. Okay, um, uh, this is about the runtime overhead. Okay, so in those three video games that we did, if you uh, this is the time where you're doing the contract checking at runtime, we're able to verify all the contracts. So if you eliminate them, uh, right, it's a potentially massive uh, speed up that you get here. Uh, and like I said, we're able to uh, generate counterexamples. So here's that argmin function I showed. Uh, 
and um, it will synthesize uh, a program like this that will cause a crash to happen. And I think there's a couple interesting things going on here. One is it generates functions for you. And two, the counter example here uh, is it's not obvious. Uh, well, uh, you can't hit it with a one element list, right? Because a one element list, that's always uh, the minimizing element, even if you have a bad function that produces complex numbers. Uh, so uh, it's able to figure out, oh, you need at least two elements in the list in order to trigger the comparison, which then uh, gets the function to produce a complex number, which causes less than to crash. Okay. Um, so these are things like the imperative programs that we saw before. I'm going to skip over this. Okay. We've got some papers on this um, and uh, an implementation there. I want to, in the, in the time remaining, um, maybe talk about another instance of this recipe. So I had started with you know, saying that we'd like to get to this point where we, you can do actual like, theorem proving uh, by doing contract verification in your language. And you're going to need more than just what I've shown you in order to do that, for example, you need to know that your, program, that your function is total. Okay? So you need to know that it terminates. Um, uh, I wanted to mention, actually, that this work is really being, this, all of the work I've presented here is led by uh, my PhD student, Phil Wynn. Um, so I get invited to talk, but he's the guy who's, uh, who's made all this stuff happen. But uh, we have this paper that's appearing at Nopal. Uh, that's for the papers that get rejected at Popple. Uh, um, uh, but um, we have this paper on, uh, so we have this goal of uh, proving termination, and we have this recipe. So how could we do it? Well, we just need a runtime enforcement mechanism for termination. Okay, so step one is solve the halting problem. Uh, you know, step two is collect your Turing award, I guess. But, um, uh, but that's, that's sort of exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a runtime mechanism for enforcing termination uh, and then take our symbolic semantics and verify that your program never violates that runtime monitoring mechanism. And if you could do that, then you would effectively prove that your program terminates. And along the way, you get this handy language feature, which is a contract saying this function terminates. And if you can't prove it, you can check it at runtime. Okay. Uh, so that's what we did. And we started with this, um, this classic paper, the size change principle for program termination. And if you look at this paper, what it's about is uh, is proving that programs terminate. And the approach that it takes is, first, you abstract the program into uh, a graph, basically, a call graph. You can think of it. And then you check this property about um, paths in the graph that they have this uh, size change property. Okay. So we looked at that and thought, well, let's just swap the order in which we do these things. Let's check the property precisely at runtime and then abstract the program into some over approximation. Okay? So we figured out sort of we figured out that in this paper there is uh, there is a runtime enforcement mechanism waiting to get out. And we distilled it into uh, a check that you can do at runtime that is about sort of inspecting uh, the arguments to every function call and seeing if it's preserving this, uh, this kind of ordering property. Okay. So we did, we, so we implemented that. Then we, uh, basically ran it through our, uh, symbolic semantics in order to have a termination checker. Okay. So what's happening is at runtime, you are not checking, you are not in fact solving the halting problem, right? You are checking for this size change termination property, which is itself a um, sufficient but not necessary condition for termination. Uh, so 
uh, and then you can further abstract it uh, uh, to, to do the static, static checking. Okay, so we did this and then we looked at a number of tools that do uh, static termination checking and compared it against that. So let me, let me just show you. So here's, um, the benchmark here is all of the programs from the original size change termination paper. And we looked at Liquid Haskell, Isabel, uh, and ACL2. And then we looked at our dynamic contract. Uh, and then also, can we statically verify that dynamic contract? Okay, so in the original thing, right, we, it works out well. Other tools work on it, uh, work as well for those. Liquid Haskell uh, had a little bit of a problem with it, um, but fine. Uh, there is a follow-up paper uh, about doing higher order uh, size change termination. We're already higher order, so we can, uh, we can take those examples. Uh, okay, ACL2 is sort of categorically eliminated here because it's first order. Uh, and uh, I think the important thing is, so dynamically, this is gonna be true on all these benchmarks, dynamically we can always check it. Um, and uh, statically we sort of do as well as Liquid Haskell or Isabel. And we didn't have to work very hard to get this uh, to go through, we just had to figure out what was the runtime enforcement mechanism that's kind of implicitly in that SCT paper. Uh, then we looked at the Isabel termination uh, analysis paper and took its benchmarks. Okay, so you'll notice Isabel doesn't, uh, doesn't actually get all of the uh, examples that it has in that paper. I think that's probably just attributed to things evolving over time and the termination checker changing and things like that. Uh, Liquid Haskell can't do any of these. Uh, ACL2 can do some. Dynamically, we can do them all, and then statically, we don't, we don't do so well, right? One out of five. Uh, ACL2, okay, Liquid Haskell uh, can't do it. Isabel can't do it. <laughs> ACL2 can only do one <laughs> of the three. Uh, we do no worse than ACL2, and, uh, but dynamically, we can check we can check these things. Uh, and then Liquid Haskell, if we take the examples in that paper, okay, Liquid Haskell uh, continues to be able to do those examples. Uh, Isabel can't do them all. Dynamically, we can do them, and statically, we can't quite do all of them. Yeah? So, do you have an idea about what's the reason why, like, when someone like, drew these examples, this is all there? I would think that it's, it's, I mean, they're pretty radically different approaches, so I would think it doesn't boil down to just a SMT choice, but I don't have a better answer than that. Um, um, there's more details uh, in that uh, NOPL paper, um, so about which, so you can look at which particular programs, and we, we tried to give these tools, you know, the benef benefit of the doubt and added, you know, annotations where they needed them and things like that to, to try to make it be as favorable as we could to the others. We also have some larger uh, scheme benchmark programs that we were able to do, uh, and so on, okay? So, um, so yeah, so I think it, this recipe can work just as well for things like termination, and now you might start wondering, are there other kinds of uh, properties that you would like to verify and the thing to look for is, is there a runtime mechanism that you can, that you can leverage? Uh, and sometimes that leads to interesting work in runtime enforcement mechanisms like this did, uh, and sometimes it leads to interesting work on the static verification side. Okay, so, uh, so that's my talk. Thank you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> any, any objections or questions about that statement? <laughs> Both. <laughs> I have a question, actually. Yeah, so here's the Moloch 
symbolic semantics, not the thing you get after you throw it through AAM. Is that right? That's right. Once you throw it through AAM, you, right, right. you lost it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, you sort of know that if there is a counterexample, you don't need AAM, right? You can just I see. You right, can keep running. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. So you will you will find it. Right, right. Yeah. By just bumping up the polyvariance or whatever in some way. By just letting the symbolic right, right. semantics go, right? So, right. So, oh, sure. So the the question is: so for things like uh, uh, runtime errors, uh, you can just run the thing, and if there is one, you will eventually find it. But this isn't true for termination. Uh, so it it it's. That's accurate. It's not true for termination, but uh, for violating the size change termination principle, it is, right? So you can just run things. And you know that if the program ever eventually violates the size change termination principle, you can't. So it's important to n you know that the property isn't termination. The property is SCT, right? Which uh, if, if the program has the size change termination principle, that implies that it terminates. Uh, but there, there may be programs that terminate that don't have that property. Uh, maybe I, I didn't understand the first part of the question. Uh, so. Can I understand the approach yeah. that you're taking in that ah. dynamic setting as by symbolic evaluation, yeah. abstracted, generating verification conditions, and dispatching those to a, a, a norm? Is, so, the, so the question is can you understand uh, the approach as? Uh, take the program, symbolically execute it, abstract it, generate a bunch of verification conditions, to, and dismiss them with a SMT solver. Yes. Basically, to generate all traces. Um, That's exactly what we're doing, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, the first part is a lot of questions. This is great work and uh, also a really great presentation. Oh, thank you. Where is the presentation for some complicated stuff that I've seen before? Oh, thanks. Really nice work. With one of the questions that came up at ICFT earlier this week, and somebody said, there's a gradual planning problem, and somebody said, yeah, but if you're trying to gradually integrate Haskell and Azure, you have this problem that the Haskell program might not terminate mm -hmm. and violate. So, so using your technique, as long as the Haskell program stuff's always getting smaller, you could actually verify. Uh, yeah, so that's true. So you could verify the Haskell code actually terminates, potentially statically, and you could also just say, in the same way that gradual typing says, so treat the Haskell code as untyped for termination and enforce a contract at runtime for it using this mechanism. Right. So and once you have that contract, it, it's guaranteed to, to terminate. And was that yeah. your motivation for looking at termination, or were you yeah. looking at for different reasons? No, that, that's what it was, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's more generally useful, but that's what brought us to that, was we wanted to, we wanted to do exactly that, you know, something like Haskell to Agda, and, uh, uh, and we'd need that. Yeah. Jeremy. So when you add the size change contract to one of these untyped functions, right. functions right. um so am I right in understanding that you could then sort of like transliterate this to Agda or maybe not Agda or Isabel, something with size change, termination checking, and then it would accept it as a as a function, as a total function in one of those You know, I hadn't I hadn't thought of that. Sorry, can you Oh, sorry. The, uh, so the question was, um, uh, if you attached one of these contracts to, say, a Haskell function, one of the termination uh, contracts to a Haskell function, could you then sort of transliterate that into something that uh, Agda would accept as terminating? Uh, 
I hadn't considered that, but that makes sense to me that, uh, that it potentially could, that you would sort of compile in the monitor for s size change termination. That's a program that terminates, and so presumably uh, you ought to be able to get that to statically verify in something like Acta, I ha but I hadn't thought about that. So, um, so I think in the uh, yeah uh, sorry uh, uh, the question was it seems like we focus on mostly typed code interacting with small unknown untyped things uh, and can it work sort of from the other perspective or do you not have enough information there right um, so I think the way that I presented it uh, is mostly from that perspective that you said of uh, typed programs interacting with unknown untyped programs. But uh, in fact, all of those benchmarks, they're all just uh, scheme, well, racket uh, programs. So there are no types there. So it works. Uh, so it's able to verify type safety properties and then things beyond that, but, um, but doesn't rely actually on the type system at all. Right? So it works, it works well for untyped code. Final question. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.